And this is our fifth Sunday in Churchy Words. If you would go and take your Bibles, turn in, turn on your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 is a passage of Scripture that if you've been in church for a while, you've probably heard before. It's, it deals directly with a, a churchy term, I guess you could say. But it's one that's very important. Every week as we've been walking through this series, uh, we're looking at, at very important topics, important ideas, words and terms that we say. We may even use pretty often. And, uh, and sometimes we do it so casually that we actually forget to explain what they are. And sometimes in church life, you can kind of speak your own language. And you can easily kind of uh, just uh, be talking and people not know what you're talking about. But then even beyond that, a lot of times I think Christians are, are bad about uh, actually saying, uh, talk about topics and, and terms, and they really don't fully understand or grasp the doctrinal importance of what they're talking about. So today we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. In Ephesians chapter 6, beginning verse 10, man, Paul really speaks to this issue, and it's an important issue, but just like anything else that we've talked about over the course of the last weeks, um, and, and really just a, a recurring theme in my teaching, I can promise you this is what we're going to hear over and over, is just that with, with anything in Scripture and an understanding of us, our obedience with Christ, we need to be balanced and make sure that we are centered on God's Word, that we don't err on one side or the other, that we don't go to an extreme even, and, uh, and passionately embrace one doctrine or idea at the cost of the entire Word of God. Uh, that's easy to do in, in, in several categories, but uh, one is kind of end times. I don't know if you know this, but you ever, you ever turn on the TV, some, some of these guys, uh, all they do is talk about end times, eschatology, and they, they just get really passionate about end times, and that's all they talk about. And it's really they try to convert people to their, their position of eschatology rather than uh, to Jesus sometimes. And, and this is another one of those cases where... It's not a debate, in my opinion, is, is spiritual warfare a real thing? Absolutely it is. But sometimes we could go to an extreme, and we can almost make everything spiritual warfare. Or we could go to the other extreme, and we could act like it doesn't exist at all. We could just be naive or foolish in that regard. Either one of those are, in my opinion, absolute errors, and we cannot uh, embrace that. So here's the deal. Uh, the devil is not to blame for everything bad that happens, right? Not everything. You ever had one of those days where you just wake up and, and you lose your keys and, uh, and, and you don't know where they are, and then, and then you, know, you, you go out the door, you trip over your dog, and, and you fall, you get in the car, you spill your coffee in your lap. Have you ever had that kind of day? I, I don't have a dog, so I, that's the only exception for me. But, uh, but, you know, sometimes you just have a bad day. You know, it's a bad day. Well, Christians are funny. Sometimes we'll just be like, man, the devil's just been all over me all morning, you know? Like the devil hit our keys in the refrigerator, right? That doesn't, that's not going to, you can't blame him for everything, right? There's some stuff we just, we just really dumb and we, we kind of make mistakes, right? And sometimes we make errors. Sometimes we, we uh, you know, do, do ludicrous things and, and it kind of positions our, ourselves for the bad day. But I will say this it, it, even though we don't need to blame everything bad on the devil, we also should recognize and be fully aware that the devil is after you, man. He really is. That's not some kind of scare tactic. That's a spiritual truth. That's an absolute fact from God's Word that Satan is not your friend. He's your enemy, and he wants to kill you. He wants to distract you from God's best for you. He also wants to discredit you. He wants to take away your testimony so that you can't be, make, make an, an appropriate impact in our culture. He wants to do everything he can to remove your influence so that you can't bring people to the cross of Jesus Christ. But in other words, sometimes he wants us to really just... Just uh, make mistakes so that instead of bringing people to the cross, we push people away. So the devil is not on your side. And, and so, man, it's great to sing all these songs because here's the truth. We do, in the power of Jesus Christ, have confidence and power over these attacks. And so, again, if you're here and maybe you're a guest, you're just checking church out, right? You're just kind of checking uh, this whole thing about God out. And, and, and I would say this is still very important to you. Because this is what you can understand. You share the same fallen world that we live in. You know the stuff that everyone faces. But here's what I would say. This is not going to sound very encouraging. But when you embrace Jesus Christ, the truth is that's when the battle really begins. Now, you've been born into a battlefield no matter what. we have born into a fallen world. We talked about that last week. So we're, we're, we're sinners. We, we, we sin because we're sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We're born into sin. So we're born into this battlefield but man, if you think, uh, like some people would tell you, that when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, that all of a sudden your bank account balance goes up, and you know your husband and wife are nice to you again, and like everything's you know great, right? Is that is that what is that the way it happens? You know, no. 
No, men, be careful about what you agree with up here, all right? Uh, but, but, you know, that's not the way it happens. Life doesn't go perfect. It's not perfect, but here's what we know. The difference is the power of God now is living inside of you, right? You have a relationship with Jesus, and so the battlefield is different. You see the battlefield different. And every, every battle you're, you're involved in, I mean, everything, the context of the fight is totally different. And so it's so important. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Here's what it says. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the mighty power, in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. Would you say those three words with me? Stand firm then. So even when you're at the end of your, your rope, even when everything gets difficult, it's saying, yeah, yeah, stand. Paul is saying, stand firm. But even when... The fight is so hard, you're exhausted, and you're absolutely spiritually discouraged. Stand firm then. Don't quit, you know? Don't, don't give up. So the question really becomes, well, well, how do we do that, all right? And that's really what I hope we can answer uh, during this short time uh, this morning. Uh, several principles we'll just pull out of Ephesians chapter 6. We're not going to really camp in the individual armors, I mean, the, the pieces of armor. If you've been in, in church life a lot, that's kind of what we would normally do, is kind of walk through some of the individual pieces of armor. I want to give us some overarching principles of spiritual warfare found in Ephesians 6, and they're going to involve some of these pieces that are mentioned here in the text. But the first one is this. Listen, following Jesus leads us straight into a battlefield. And we've kind of already mentioned this. If you're following Jesus, it, it, is, it is going to be into a war. It's going to be into a battlefield. Uh, and, and we've said this before. I mean, if we just think common sense, if we're following Jesus, then we're going to go where he went, we're going to go where he goes. And, and here's the deal. He went to a cross. Jesus himself died for me. I mean, he, he literally sacrificed everything. And so if I'm, I'm a really a follower of Jesus, then following Jesus leads me somewhere, and that somewhere is first sacrifice, all right? That, that's just a, a no-brainer. That, that's an easy thing for us to embrace if we're truly followers of Jesus, is that wherever Jesus goes, I'm going, and that's where he went. And with that in mind also, we have to understand that as we follow Jesus, the closer we get to Jesus, the attacks don't minimize, they actually become more. They increase. And so you may say, well, why, man? That doesn't make any sense. Why would you say, and why would you try to say that? Some people may not get saved because you're telling them that getting saved means it's going to get really tough. But here's why. Listen, I want you to think about this. The target of, of the aggression of Satan is, is Jesus himself. All right? Sometimes we, we start thinking too highly of ourselves, and we think maybe that we're, we're so awesome. <laughs> you know, we're such a good person that the devil really has to target us. And, and I, do, I do agree and believe this, that if you're really doing something for God, the devil is going to have a target on you, man. All right? If, if a church is really doing something for the cause of Christ to impact the nations... For the glory of God, man, there is going to be some satanic oppression and aggression against that body of believers. So I do believe that. But listen, here's the deal. The target of Satan, his aggression, his wrath, his anger, man, it's targeted at Jesus. And so here's the deal. If, 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 if Satan's not on your back, it may be because you're not very close to Jesus, all right? And, and the more we get into where God wants us to be, the closer we get to God and the closer we get to Christ, then here's the deal the closer we are to the target of Satan, and the more aggression from the enemy we're going to feel. And so this is just a principle that we have to live with, and that is when we follow Jesus, it's going to lead us straight into a battlefield. That's just part of it. First Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 8, look on the screen. It says, be alert, be alert, be alert, and, uh, and sober mind. Your, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion for someone to devour. Resist him. I want you to think about it for a moment. A roaring lion. Now, the roar of a lion never attacked anyone, right? That's true. And I can even say the, the, the bark of a dog never bit anyone, right? That's true. But uh, I do believe the Holy Spirit speaks through dogs, right? I mean, if you're going to somebody's house, they got a big dog that's mean, God bless them. Amen? I'm not going to the door. That's, that's just the Holy Spirit. I, th- I really do. No, not really, kind of. I do believe that a little bit. But anyway, uh, the truth of the matter is that the roar of a lion... Never attacked anybody. And sometimes believers, 
hear the roar, and because maybe we've been attacked and defeated before, we hear the roar of the lion, and it causes us to cower down. Maybe it causes us to run and hide. Sometimes, but here's the deal. We just don't want to fight, and so we hear the roar of the lion, and we're, we're literally, we're just kind of misappropriated in the body and in the army, so we're not on the front line anymore. We run. We run from the fight. You may say, well, preacher, that's because we don't need to get, we don't need to fight the devil, right? Well, here's the deal. It's not, the scripture never says don't fight the devil. We, just, we don't fight in our own power. And so we don't run from the enemy just because we hear the, the lion's roar. We stand. In fact, the whole point of Ephesians 6 is that we stand firm. We're not going to fall. We're not going to cower down. We're not going to back up. But man, it's not as easy as it sounds. And I, and I hope and pray you'll stay engaged. You'll lean in a little bit and you'll get this because I'm telling you, this message, truly, Ephesians 6, 10, will change your Christian life if you'll listen and if you'll really embrace the ideas. Look on further. It says in verse 9, here's the key, resist him, right? Resist him. It doesn't say run from him. It doesn't say, you know, chicken out, right? It doesn't say sit down. Resist the devil, standing firm in the faith. So it doesn't mean you, you don't stand, right? You resist And you stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Sometimes we we just honestly start throwing a pity party for ourselves. And we start thinking about all that's bad in our life. We start thinking about how many people are against us. We start, you know, trying to think about the words that we have heard people say. And maybe even we start hearing the whispers of the enemy himself. And, and we start believing the lies. And, and here's the deal. We could easily start saying, man, woe is me. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. It seems like, man, my, my case is so unique. And, and there's no one that understands my situation. Listen, Scripture tells us, and we know in, in, in just reasonable terms, that our, our situation, our circumstance... It's not a one of a kind, all right? Our, our fight as a believer, it's a common fight. It's a common fight. It may look a little different, but here's the deal. Everybody in this room, every man, woman, boy, and girl in this room, every one of you are a target of the enemy. Every one of you. And every one of you, if you know it or not, are in a fight. And so we share this. And here's the deal. Sometimes we come to church and we just act like we're not in a fight. Why don't we just be real with God? Why don't we just be real with one another and say, you know what, I'm going to fight, and this is the place where I come back and I get healed. It's like a hospital for the wounds that I, I, I receive out in the fight every day. It's the place where we get encouragement. We don't get people, we don't kick people when they're down, but we love one another, we encourage one another. This is a place of healing, right, not hurt. And so understand that's, that's really the picture of, of what the church should be. Look at verse 10. And the God of all grace who called you to his gl- uh, eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while. We like to take that part out totally. After you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. What's all that mean? It means don't give up, man. In the midst of the fight, in the midst of the battle, embrace the restoration of victory that's not here yet. Because here's the deal. He has promised it will come. He has promised it. So we can stand firm in the faith knowing that he is going to deliver us. So following Jesus leads us straight into the battlefield. Secondly, I want you to see, we can't win this fight alone. And that that is really what we've been saying already. Verse 10 tells us, be strong in the Lord. It doesn't say be strong in your family. It doesn't even say be strong in your church. It doesn't say be strong in your degree. It doesn't say be strong in your job. You know, we, we, we are so bad about gaining strength in our own minds and thinking that those, those other things are what brings us strength. Here, here's a, a tough one. It doesn't say be strong in your bank account, right? It doesn't. Now, I want you to just ask yourself a question. Please don't raise your hand. But I want you to ask yourself this question. You know, which one do you depend on more for strength, money or God? Which one do you depend on more on a daily basis throughout the week and throughout your life, throughout the year? You know, what do you... What do you practically depend on more money or God you see this is such a tough question but the scriptures do not tell us to be strong in our money it says be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and so if we're going to fight this fight if we're saying yes to following Jesus and we're going to fight this fight we need to fight it with not not only with God on our side with us on God's side like we talked about lordship a couple weeks ago where do we find strength for the fight in the Lord 
All other sources will fail. If we try to do it ourselves, if we try to be big enough, strong enough, man, I'm going to fall flat on my face. I can't do it alone. I, I've got to have the power of God in order to succeed as a believer. So Paul instructs next in verse 11, he instructs us to put on the full armor of God. And this is kind of a, a similar thing, but it's even a little different because you talk about us being selective sometimes. We, we like to pick and choose what parts of Scripture to, to, to uh, hold to. Some people would pick and choose what parts of the armor, you know, to, uh, to put on. I'm reminded, man, of uh, Jason Witten. I'm a Cowboys fan, which now, it, for, for the first time in a decade, I can be happy. That's pretty good. But uh, d- d- y'all are not NFL fans, I can see. But Jason Witten used to play for Tennessee. When he played for Tennessee, one time... They took his uh, helmet off in a hit. You know, somebody hit him real hard, and his helmet popped off or something. And this guy, he's a tight end. He is just a beast. He's awesome. And uh, when, when his helmet came off, he didn't, like, you know, slide to the ground like, like the little quarterbacks do or, you know, run out of bounds. This guy, this guy with, like, blood coming out of his eyes, he was just like, he was an animal, man. No helmet, and he continued to run, and he got a touchdown. That's crazy, man, right? But here's the deal. Some people say, well, well, you know what? I, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, play. Uh, I don't want to play football without a helmet. And I would I, sometimes. Do you ever see people riding motorcycles without a helmet in South Carolina? When you move from Georgia to South Carolina, that really messes with you. All right. I'm just going to tell you, because in Georgia it's a law. You got to have a helmet on. Well, around we we'll see people without a helmet. Well, like, he didn't have a helmet on. Want to roll your window down? You don't have a helmet. I think he knows, right? I think he knows. Some people just choose not to wear one. Well, here's why I say, you know, with your armor, you can't pick and choose. All right. You can't pick and choose. You can't say, well, you know what? I'm going to let the wind blow in my, my hair today. I'm not, not going to put a helmet. You've got to wear what God says to wear. Or here's what happens. You're creating vulnerabilities in your life. And see, that's, that, that's why we fall. That's why we fail. Because we pick and choose where we're going to follow Jesus. We're going to pick and choose where we take his advice. And, uh, and just practically speaking, when you don't wear armor, part of you is not covered. All right? And that's a vulnerability for the enemy's attack. And so he's going to find those places. You may say, man, you're giving the devil a whole lot of credit. I'm just telling you, even from personal experience, it happens. It happens. You let your guard down, you may say, and this is, men are so bad about this. You may say, man, I can handle that, all right? I can handle this, this pornography thing, all right? You may, you may say, I can handle this. Is not, this is not that big a deal. I, I can handle it. I can handle it. I can, I can uh, make sure that it doesn't go too far, this relationship with that woman or this man at work. I make sure it doesn't go too far. I can flirt a little bit, and it, it's not going to be a big deal. See, the devil will find your vulnerabilities. He'll find them, man, and he will exploit those vulnerabilities. He is not your friend. He's looking for them. He will find your vulnerabilities, and he will not play around. He will throw everything. He will leverage every resource he has at your vulnerability. And, and, and listen, you know as well as I do, you will fail God. You will fail God if you don't put on the armor. So understanding that, this is so important that we don't just pick and choose where we obey God. As you know, we don't just say, well, this part, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put on this part of the armor, but I'm not going to put on that part. Listen, we just gotta, we've got to say yes to God. Whatever he says to do, we say yes. Follow Jesus, lead straight to a battlefield, and we can't win this fight alone. We've got to be obedient to him. So how can we tap into this awesome power that God has provided to us. I want you to look at verse 12 again. Ephesians 6, verse 12. Here's what it says. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, at first read, when you just read that kind of thing, I know some people who look at even Christianity, they think, uh, some people would immediately start thinking mysticism. They start thinking, oh, you know, spirits... Uh, blah, 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 and start being critical. I want you to, for just a moment, really just think, listen, this is real, all right? This is real. We're not talking about some play game. We're not talking about some TV show. You know, we're, we're talking about serious spiritual interaction with, um, with, I believe with all my heart, just as Scripture says, with demonic forces. Now, you may say, well, preacher, that sounds so crazy, man. And so what, what are you talking about? Here's how it fleshes out practically. Practically, we may think that we're supposed to see some, like, you know, exorcist thing happening. You know, the movie is crazy, right? That's, uh, I, here's what happens. Practically speaking, the devil, again, finds vulnerabilities in your armor, and he will attack them. He will exploit every opportunity. And what happens is he starts speaking lies into our lives. We're going to talk about that even a, a little more in just a moment. But as he speaks those lies, we begin to listen. 
And, and we, we pick the wrong target because he convinces us that someone else is the enemy. So here's the, the next thing. We can't defeat an enemy we can't identify. We cannot defeat an enemy we can't identify. And in and, and, and verse 12, it just tells you very clearly that, look, the enemy is not people around you. Uh, you, you can say it like this, the, the enemy is not your husband. Man, the men ought to be like, Amen, brother, I'm telling you the truth about that. Yes, I'm with you. The enemy is not your, your wife, it's not your kids, it's not your parents. They're not the enemy. Your enemy is not your boss. It's not. The enemy is not the other political party you don't support, all right? The enemy is not both candidates of both political parties, regardless of who you are. Listen, the enemy is, is, is the devil himself. And here's what he does. He, he puts us against one another by deceiving us. He lies to us and he tells us that, hey, your, your wife disrespects you. Your husband, he doesn't really love you. You, you think he loves you? Why does he do this? Why does he do that? See, we, we've convinced ourselves that's just like some inner voice. You know, it's just like some pity party thing we have. Listen, the devil is going to exploit your weaknesses in the most practical ways. And he's going to find it. So here's, here's I want you to just be wise with this because it's so important. And, and, and as we prepare, that's really the next thing. We must prepare for battle. We've got to prepare. I want to put some practical concepts and principles in your hands. Even if you haven't been taking notes, I want to challenge you for the next few minutes. Pull out a pen and paper and take some of these things down. Because I promise you, if you feel like there's been times in your life where the devil has lied to you, or maybe some of this is making sense, and you're going, you know what, I've been listening to stuff, and I, I believe the wrong thing about me all the time, and that kind of thing. Man, listen, this is so important. The enemy's primary weapons are trickery, persuasion, and accusation. You could say deception, uh, temptation, and accusation. Uh, you know, the devil's going to come at you in these three ways, all right? It doesn't matter what the, the attack is. He's going to come at you with trickery, persuasion, or accusation. Satan has been a deceiver, man, forever, right? In fact, going back to Genesis 3, 4, he started out. I mean, he, if there's one thing we know, he's predictable. He's predictable. He's a predictable liar, He's consistent in his, in his deceit. And in Genesis 3, 4, Eve, you know, had listened to God. And God said, hey, eat anything you want except that tree. If you eat that tree, you're going to die, right? That's what God said. That was the truth, all right? That was the truth. The devil comes as a deceiver, and he says, oh, Eve, 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 Eve. You're not going to surely die. You're not going to really die, Right? And so the deceiver lies to uh, the follower of God. God has established truth, but we listen to a lie that leads us to temptation, and we fall prey to sin. John 18, just calls the devil out. He calls Satan out. He says he was the father of all lies, Jesus said. Look, the devil, it's not like he tricks us to the point to where we, we aren't given a warning that he's a deceiver. He is consistently a deceiver. He's a liar. And so, here's the question. Have you ever noticed that when we're wrong, we're usually also stubborn? It's really ridiculous, but people are often confidently ignorant. I think we all are. And, and some of you wives are like, yeah, that's you know, but it's all of us. I, I really do believe we're all confidently ignorant sometimes. But the most confident person is not always the most accurate person. It doesn't matter how much we are convinced we're right, you know? And here's the deal. You may have somebody in mind, and you may say, I know that person I do not like them. You may even use the H word, man. You may say, I hate that person. That person is just, it's got it out. They never have liked me. That group of people, they just, I, they never include me. Uh, my boss, he has it out for me. I'm, I'm just trying to fire me. You know, you may, no matter what it is. We, the, and, and here's, we may be certain of that. But the most confident person is not always the most right. You can have a man stand on the top of a 90-story building and jump off. And at every window, he could say, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. You think he's going to be fine? No, he's not going to be fine. Why? Because he jumped off in a 94 building. I, I mean, that's ridiculous, right? So a man's confidence in the lies will not prevent his demise. A man's confidence in, in, in what, what the fallacy that he's listening to is not going to mean that he's okay. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to think for a moment, to embrace this challenge to, to look at your assumptions and, and think for a moment they could be wrong. They could be wrong today. The assumptions you have about the enemy, the assumptions you have about people in your life, 
the assumptions you have about your wife or your husband, the assumptions you have about your parents or your children, the assumptions you have about your neighbors or your boss, all of those assumptions could be absolutely false. And the reason we know that is because the devil is such a liar. And it may very well you be you just been listening to the liar. Listen, consider the possibility that you're even, you're even blaming the wrong person when you blame yourself. And it may be that everyone else in the world has forgiven you. Jesus himself died on the cross so that you could be forgiven by the Father and you've never forgiven yourself. I want to challenge you to do what Christ did. If you're a follower of Jesus, where did he go? He went to forgive you. So if Jesus can forgive you, follow him. <laughs> follow him and forgive yourself, right? Follow him and forgive your brother. Follow him and forgive that person that did you wrong. Follow him and assume the best of a group of people that you think are your enemies. Love them, man. Invest in them. Assume the best. And challenge your assumptions today. Uh, what, is, what is the greatest weapon against deception? This is so important. Truth. Truth is the greatest weapon against deception. Verse 14 and 17. Look at Ephesians 6. Verse 14 says, Stand firm with the belt of truth. Right? That's that, that piece of the armor. The belt of truth. Truth. Truth, right? Buckled around your waist. And verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, when the devil comes at us with deception, when he tries to tell us uh, we're this or we're that, we're, we're, we're a loser, you know, we're, we're, we're not valuable to God, we're, there's nothing good in us, there's no way we're ever going gonna, gonna, gonna to be able to overcome a temptation, there's, there's no way we're going to ever be able to contribute uh, a way that, that our friends do, or it's never going to be ever a way we, we could really uh, be a person that, you know, that is proud of who they are. And, and here's the deal. The devil's going to tell you all these lies. I want to challenge you when he comes at you with those lies, stand in the truth of God's word. Because the truth of God's word, we sung about it all morning, we're more than a conqueror, right? We're more than a conqueror. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Read Romans 8, man. When the devil comes at you with a bunch of lies, pick up the word of God and begin to read the truth. It is the truth. It is the truth, and the devil's going to try his very best to pull you away. He's going to try to make you doubt your own value in God. He's going to try to make you doubt other people's love for you. He's going to try to convince you that no one is on your side, that everyone has deserted you. And so at some point in time, we have to just honestly grow up in Christ enough to be able to look the devil in the eyes and tell him that he is a liar. He's a liar, and we're not going to listen to it anymore. So temptation often follows this deception. The devil deceives us, but then he tempts us. So what scriptures say about that? Let me give you three scriptures. Have that pen ready. James 4, 7. This is a simple passage. Everybody needs to memorize it. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Man, that's a powerful passage. Submit yourselves then. Would you look at the... Go and read it with me. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know why the devil doesn't flee from you most of the time? Why the devil doesn't flee from me most of the time? It's when we refuse to submit to uh, God or when we refuse to resist the devil. Sometimes we sin because we want to, right? Sometimes we fall prey to temptation because we, we, it's attractive. And, and we don't resist the devil. We just choose, we choose to embrace the enemy instead of the deliverer. Man, that's crazy. But it really is true. And so that's such a simple passage. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That is a simple fact. Matthew 26, 41, another passage you need to write down. Watch and pray. We've been looking at passages that say, be alert, right? Because this roaring lion is coming around. The, the devil wants to get you. He's trying to devour your family. He wants to defeat you. And so when we know he's coming, you need to be alert. Here in Matthew 26, 41, he says, watch. Be alert. Watch. Don't let your guard down. I mean, don't let your guard down. The, the day you let your guard down is the day you'll be vulnerable and the day he'll get you. Watch. And what else? Pray. Pray. Man, if we're, if, our, if we're dependent on the strength from God, we need to tap into this power of prayer. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh whew, is weak, man. Third and final, Psalm 119.11. Psalm 119.11 just basically, David said, look, you've got to hide the word of God. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. So hide the word in your heart to provide strength over sin. We need to do that. And we'll kind of recap that in just a moment at the very end. But, man, those, those are powerful passages. Third thing, the way the devil comes at you is he's an accuser. He comes at you with accusations. 
And so Satan is known as the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12.10 is called the accuser of the brethren. He doesn't just deceive you. He doesn't just tempt you, but he also accuses you. And we have heard these accusations because, again, we're, we're, we're fully aware that the devil is, is trying to let us hear uh, these lies. And at the same time, we hear these accusations. And so what do we do? First of all, in verse 14, we stand firm on the promises of God. We've said it already. But you've got to stand on the truth, what God has said about you, what God has said about what he's done in you. And so if we stand firm on the truth of God's word, then we're going to understand that the accusations of the devil are powerless. Number two, live in your present freedom, not your past failure. I want to say that again. Please write it down. Listen, listen. Live in your present freedom, not your past failure. Last week we talked about Romans 8.1. There's therefore now. <laughs> There's therefore now. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Stop living in your past failure. Man, hey, if we just go and take a survey, who failed in our past? Right? I mean, everybody. And I know five people thought I was serious. All right, if you've made a mistake in your past, raise your hand. All right, the other half of you guys are really needing to come to the altar and pray for lying. Amen? That's just true. So all of us have messed up, all right? We've all failed God. We've all, we've, we're failures without Jesus, man. And so if we were going to live in our past, we would all be depressed and discouraged uh, spiritually. I, I, I can't possibly live in my past. I mean, if I'm living in my past, I'm not living in victory. I'm living in defeat. Thanks be to God. Look, the cross didn't just give us eternal life. The cross gave us abundant life now, right? So there's therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. As long as we are positioned in Christ, then we no longer live in our past. We, we're, not, we're not living in the old. Look, we're living in the new. So live in, in your present freedom, not in your past failure. Jesus Christ has delivered you. You may be hung up and you may say, man, I just can't get over this. I just can't, I can't forget what I did and I can't forget how bad I was and I can't. Listen, Jesus has cast that sin as far as the east is from the west. And, and if, you're, if you're still hanging on to it, look, you're the only one because God himself does not remember it. It says he will remember it no more. Man, aren't you glad for that? That is so awesome to know that, look, we don't live in our past failure. We, we live in the victory we live in the victory of what Christ has done for us. And so we live in this present freedom that Jesus has given to us. Third and final, acknowledge and have confidence in the armor. Have, have confidence in the armor that you've already been given. Verses 14 through 17 talk about the breastplate of righteousness. Talk about uh, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. All these things through verse 17. Listen, embrace those. Man, I challenge you, don't, don't leave one thing out. If there's application to be had here, it's, look, don't, don't drop the ball. Don't, don't, don't think you don't need the helmet. Don't think you don't need the, the, the breastplate. Be, be fully covered so that your vulnerabilities are, are not exploited by the enemy. So what's the take, homes? Man, give up. You may say, preacher, you've been telling me to stand firm. You're telling me to keep fighting. I say, give up. Not to the devil. Give up to God. Surrender to him. Surrender to him. Say, say, I'm done fighting in my own power. I want to fight in yours, God. I can't, but you can. It's your battle. I'm going to let you work in me. I'm going to let you work. Identify the enemy. Stop attacking your brother or your sister. Stop attacking a lost man who needs Jesus to. Identify the enemy. Internalize the word. It's hard to, <clears throat> hard to stand in the truth you don't know. Internalize the word. And then finally, pray, pray, pray. Look, today's more than a message. I'm telling you. And this, I, I believe this. Man, with all my heart. There's people here today who need to, I mean, need to be on their face before God. I believe there's people here today who, who probably limped, limped into this room spiritually because they, they know. They get the battlefield part. They're, they're, they're exhausted spiritually because of the fight they've been in. And the devil would probably have you stay exactly where you are. The devil would say, you don't need to make any kind of decision, man. You just, hey, let's get out of this room, everything go back to normal. And listen, he will eat your lunch. He, he, will, he will have a field day in your life. I'm going to challenge you to do something that's, that's a little, uh, it's, it's public, man. It really is. I'm going to challenge you. Now, first of all, if you're, if you're one who needs to be saved, you're the most important person in this room, all right? I pray you come straight to me or one of the ministers down here. We'd love to show you how you can be saved. But believers in here, man, this is a practical invitation today. 
if you're, if you're in the middle of warfare, if you feel like the devil's just been really, truly just having a field day in your life, I'm going to encourage you to come lay it down today. I'm going to encourage you to say, look, it's not my fight, it's God's. I'm going to stand in his power. I'm not quitting. I'm going to stand in his power. And today I'm putting on the armor. I'm not quitting. I'm, I'm, I'm standing firm, firm. And what I'm going to encourage you to do is if you're a friend of somebody who comes to this altar, I don't want you to embarrass them or anything like that, but if you, if you just come and, and be with them, pray with them. Just come down and, and before God, just love on them. And say, I'm standing with you. That's all. I mean, you won't even verbally say that. Just pray. Pray for them. I, that would be such a powerful thing to see the church of Jesus Christ come together in that regard. So let's do that as God leads. Lord, we love you. God, I thank you for your word. I am thankful, God, that we are not losers. <laughs> Woo, that's awesome. I'm, I'm so thankful for the blood of Jesus that gives us victory. And so today, we stand in that victory. We don't stand in our own strength, God. We don't try to put on a show and act like we've got stuff together to the point to where we... We, we, can, we can figure it out without you, God. We need you. We are desperate for you. God, we're desperate for you. Lord, hear our prayer, and I pray you would shake us loose. Lord, some who maybe they're gripping that pew, and they're, they're already prepared not to do what you're calling them to do. God, shake them loose today, God. Lord, I pray for victory. I pray for deliverance, Lord. I, I pray for a supernatural move for those who are willing to ask for it today, God. Lord, I pray, God, that you would do what we can't do, that you would change us, change our circumstances, Lord. Turn death to life. Turn defeat to victory, Lord. We need it. We're desperate. We're crying out to you. We pray that you would work, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?